My name is Michael Moore. I'm the chair of the Global Task Force on Immunisation for the World Federation of Public Health Associations. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Michael Baker from Otago University in Wellington, New Zealand. Uh, Michael has an extraordinary background as a public health physician, as a professor of public health, and uh, he was the key leader in the uh, fight for New Zealand, the successful fight in New Zealand against uh, COVID-19. But today we're talking about allocating sustainable funding for resilient health systems. And the insights that Michael provides really are important for those who are interested in not only uh, health, but how we get there and uh, how we manage with regard to our policies and dealing with uh, our general political masters and uh, bureaucracy. Um, it's worth listening to Michael Baker. Well, kia ora koutou from New Zealand, and it's great to be joining you. And thank you, Michael, for the introduction. I'll just share my slides. And um, I think um, I'm grateful to Vivian, who has um, set the scene so well. Uh, when Michael talked to me about this, I said, well, I'm not really a health systems researcher. But of course, you realise that um, uh, the pandemic, for example, is very much a health systems um, issue. And so I'm going to really talk about this theme of uh, greater health security, uh, which I think is a priority for resilient health systems. And we've seen what happens when these systems are under huge stress as they were during the pandemic. And I'd like to think that we can learn from this experience and as everyone, as the cliche goes, build back better. So that's, I guess, the opportunity so I'm going to talk briefly about health security, uh, what we can learn from COVID-19, these uh, huge system impacts, uh, the fact that preparedness saves lives, and also a, a very um, well-designed, rapid public health response also saves lives. And also we get these multiple, I think, co-benefits from having effective health security built into the system. So uh, health security is a funny uh, term. Um, it means as far as I can tell, it means uh, completely different things, different people. There are certain definitions, and I'm just defaulting to the WHO online definition. It's these activities um, required, uh, that require both proactive and reactive um, activities to minimize the danger and impact of acute public health events that endanger people's lives across geographic regions and international boundaries. And they do note in the online discussion that really is quite a wide range of things that can fall in this range. And that includes uh, pandemics, health emergencies, but also weak health systems that cost lives and also pose great risks to the economy and um, uh, security. Uh, so there are some other very interesting comments on this, this um, uh, idea. One is really, um, uh, an, uh, an idea of moving more towards focusing on human security. And this idea has also been around for quite a long time. And that emphasizes more the focus on people rather than states and emphasizes collective action rather than competition. And I would like to see us do more of this and less perhaps of the um, more nationalistic um, or even vaccine nationalism that we saw in the pandemic. And also there's quite a bit of commentary about how uh, health security overlaps very, really intensely with investing in health systems in general, which, which does make huge sense. So just to remind you that pandemics have profoundly altered history. They all vary. And I think one of our faults, our failings recently with, with COVID-19 is to imagine they're all like influenza um, or, or some other uh, paradigm. And in fact, they vary in terms of transmissibility, severity, controllability, and also how much we know about them. And so when you're, when you're trying to think about what should we be preparing for in the future, what sort of scenarios, you can think about this combination of um, moving from low to high uh, case fatality and from low to high transmissibility. And you finish up with this quadrant here of all the things that we need to worry about in the future in the pandemic area, obviously influenza, but also smallpox if it was recreated, uh, 
emerging disease X, that's really the typical spillover events like COVID-19. But I think increasingly there's, there's a concern about novel synthetic bioweapons. So we can we know, uh, I think we're, we're all very familiar with all of the drivers of uh, emerging pandemics, our intensive livestock rearing, uh, uh, humans moving or intruding into wilderness areas, these gain-of-function experiments and the potential use of AI, and, and really, unfortunately, deteriorating international relations and really bringing up potential problems uh, with bioweapons and also biolab security. So uh, some people make a, a whole um, academic discipline about trying to uh, forecast the risk of these catastrophic events. And one of my colleagues has really looked at um, the range of estimates of um, a natural pathogen catastrophe or an engineered bio, uh, bioengineered one. And this is the risk that it might kill 10% of the population at some time this century. And so generally they're putting that risk um, at over 1% or in that range. So this is certainly the kind of catastrophic risk we do need to, to consider. So there's a huge amount of effort going into documenting lessons from COVID-19. I think we, we're probably almost over this now, but um, we've some of us have contributed to, to several of these processes of um, trying to define some of the key lessons. And um, it's just remarkable how catastrophic this, as we know, this pandemic's been. I think the, the current estimates are 25 million dead, possibly heading towards 30 million dead if you uh, really consider excess mortality calculations and a number of different um, authors uh, have, have done estimates. But I also think the long-term effects, long COVID, uh, is looking like it may be the largest single health impact from the pandemic. Uh, even the, the low-end estimates, and WH estimates may be a bit high, but um, the, the often um, additional e evidence coming out about unexpected long-term effects. So I think we're just very uncertain about this. And if, we, if you're looking at burden of disease calculations, there's always a combination of years of life lost through premature death, but also for living with disability. So that's why it'll be some time before we can really look at the human cost and the economic cost of the pandemic. So the economic cost has been uh, truly um, enormous. And we see this estimate recently of 14 trillion lost GDP to, to the US economy alone. And so obviously it's a hugely larger than this for the global economy. So I think the good news is that preparedness saves lives. And this is a study that came out recently, and this is looking at countries. It's got um, uh, 195 countries on this um, regression uh, plot. And uh, this is looking at their global health security index and their cumulative excess mortality. And this is showing what you'd really hope to see for a tool like this, that if you had a higher level of uh, global health security on the scale, you had a lower cumulative excess mortality. So I think that's a really positive finding. It says preparedness saves lives. And so you won't be able to see this, but this is showing that that index actually has six component parts. And I think it's really interesting that the most protective effect comes from this sixth index here, which is looking at the risk environment. And this includes government effectiveness, public trust in government, level of inequity and social exclusion. So I think this is really reinforcing the huge value of the um, public health associations of the world and your organized efforts, because we're really focused on these areas and it's showing that it's hugely protective for death during pandemics. So, that was the preparedness side. The other area for health system investment, of course, is having a very rapid, strong responses. And in the past, we had baked into our pandemic planning what I call a very weak response, which is that, yes, you control it, but you go to mitigation, which is just minimal controls or as much as you can manage to reduce or avoid overwhelming the health system. Or you might move up a bit to suppression but this was a revolutionary idea for pandemics, and that was elimination. Uh, initially in Wuhan, the Chinese showed they could do it, and then other countries uh, in our Asia Pacific region did the same. And there's nothing exotic about elimination. We're doing it for lots of diseases. It's just it hadn't been done for pandemic diseases before, not in the same way. So New Zealand, 
And just like Australia, we launched into an elimination strategy, not absolutely sure that it would work. It did look, I thought, very plausible and it was certainly something that we wrote about and advocated for. Uh, so if we jump ahead three and a half years, what happened? Was um, Does the evidence support the strong response? And yes, it does. I mean, the countries that pursued elimination kept their excess mortality uh, very low, particularly during that elimination period. Uh, interestingly, New Zealand, because it was it really kept a whole lot of viruses out, is now only now getting back to zero excess mortality after three and a half years. But again, other countries, Taiwan, Singapore, Australia, also in this low range compared with uh, countries that pursued suppression. So one of the things uh, about um, taking this strong response, it also protected human rights and it gave people much more freedom. And this is showing uh, the level of stringency of controls in New Zealand compared with places like Sweden, which celebrated their supposedly high level of freedom, the UK and the US. And if you look at days spent um, with um, uh, low stringency, New Zealand sustained that really through um, these two years, much lower than Sweden and other countries pursuing suppression. And we all joined really the rest of the world um, after we were highly vaccinated in 2022. So this is showing also that um, countries pursuing elimination also did very well um, economically. So really, I think um, it's a, a very strong argument, evidence-based argument for these strong proactive responses. And so um, obviously we want to enshrine these ideas at a global level and uh, we have the uh, organizations like the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness who are advocating for really a systems, a health systems uh, response at a global level. Equity of vaccine production and distribution, uh, pre uh, preventing future outbreaks and strengthening organizations like the WHO who we really need to be in a highly functional state. One of our um, concepts we put forward is really around the international legal environment, the international health regulations, and we think they should be strengthened. They're being reviewed at the moment. And that when WHO assigns this um, categorization of a public health emergency of international concern, they should also make elimination the default uh, response to that point. So elimination at source or alternatively delaying spread to allow vaccine development and other control measures. And remember with influenza, we already know the world can produce vaccine within three months to deal with a new pandemic strain. So that is not such a long waiting time uh, to have these kind of measures if you knew it would be able, you'd be able to reduce your case fatality risks down to a, a lower level. So just to remind you, of course, when you, when you actually look broadly at um, the kind of risks we need to prepare for, it's interesting, we in health think a lot about pandemics, but if you have an organization like the World Economic Forum who do this global risks survey every year, and they, this is um, a very long list of, of quite scary things, uh, 32 things on the list, uh, infections are way down here. Their, their things, the things they identify are these um, environmental disasters that we're confronted with, a failure to mitigate climate change, uh, to adapt, natural disasters, biodiversity loss, and even large-scale involuntary migration, which may well be, be driven by um, uh, climate um, uh, refugees. So um, this is a, just giving us a, a taste of the kind of range of hazards that need to be managed with a, a, a very solid global health, um, health security agenda. So this is just looking at the other categories of, of threats. These are uh, and this is, you know, honing down on New Zealand, just um, we've had, like Australia, um, a lot of um, uh, severe weather, extreme weather events and cyclones, and just how they are adding to the, the, the total of human misery. And these are mass fatality events over um, a century or more than a century, just looking at the range of hazards, some of which are very hard to prevent, but ultimately all of them have a preventable component. So... Uh, I think anyone who works in public health for very long starts to wonder, well, why are we not always making the right decisions all the time? And you start to look upstream to the kind of uh, decision-making institutions we've got. And I do find the sustainable development goals do um, uh, broaden uh, your interest in public health. I think we're probably 
think about all of these now, but I think uh, looking at ones around promoting peaceful and inclusive societies and having and building effective, accountable and inclusive institutions, this is often what drives what happens in terms of things like preparedness and investment in uh, sustainable health systems. So of course the time to invest is now. Um, you don't wait till you're on the brink of your next pandemic or your next crisis. You, when you're coming out of a crisis is a time to use this knowledge and hopefully momentum. The big problem is that I find is that we're very good at forgetting and I think it almost feels like deliberate forgetting. Um, we wanna put the pandemic in the rearview mirror and we, we can't uh, forget it. We shouldn't forget it. And this is what we did on the um, anniversary of the 1918 flu pandemic. And this was going to my son's school and getting uh, 440 of the boys to lay out in the paddock, which was quite difficult. And the photographer sent up the drone. And this was trying to get a, a picture of what it looks like if a pandemic hits, how many people would die in a day. The media were completely disinterested in this. And I do think it's a little ironic because, of course, a year later, COVID-19 was starting to spread, but hadn't been seen at that point. So uh, um, hopefully I've, I've been able to contribute to um, this theme of um, investing in uh, uh, sustainable health systems uh, or health services. And uh, uh, I think we need to look at um, public health measures such as, as, as pandemic preparedness and rapid response capacity, uh, resilience to a wide range of hazards, and ultimately addressing the wider sustainable development goals to, to try and, and reduce these drivers of major global hazards like climate change and armed conflict. And ideally, uh, health security infrastructure can also support improved public health and healthcare uh, during low threat periods as well, because this infrastructure should be very versatile. And just um, acknowledging my many colleagues who um, I've been working with uh, on these sort of ideas for a number of years. Thank you.